That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. And today's Daily Dose of Stupid, this one is pretty funny, especially since we've already been talking a little bit about socialism. So this is a clip from a uh, uh, the DNC. There was a speaker there named William Barber, and uh, he was just sort of giving his thoughts. The guy's a minister of some kind, and uh, this was his take on socialism and, and the way that people are being critical of socialism right now. We, when we embrace moral language, we must ask, does our policy care for the least of these? Does it lift up those who are most marginalized and dejected de -check, de in our society? Does it establish justice? That is the moral question. If someone calls it socialism, then we must compel them to acknowledge that the Bible must then promote socialism. Because Jesus offered free health care to everyone and he never charged a leper a copay. If you want to have, it's time for us to say, if you want to have a moral debate, bring it on, baby. The Bible says that every, the nation will be judged by how it treats the poor and the sick and women and the immigrant. The Bible says that God makes it rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you want to call caring for folk socialism, then the Constitution is a socialist document because it calls us to promote the general welfare and to establish justice. All right, so that is taking place at the DNC, and, and I love that it did because it really shows us where the modern Democrat Party is. First of all, before I get into the actual substance of what he was saying, I realize this is an ad hominem attack, but I mean, I could not, I could not pass this up. Does this guy not look exactly like the Kingpin from Into the Spider-Verse? Now look at that, <laughs> that's a side-by-side -side comparison. <laughs> He's got that little head <laughs> with like his massive body. <laughs> if they ever met a cartoon version of this dude, he would look almost exactly like the Kingpin. So anyway, I just had to point that out. Uh, maybe I watched too many comic book movies. I don't know. But that was the first thing I thought of when I saw this guy, even before I heard what he had to say. But it never ceases to amaze me that Democrats have this tendency to only dust off the Bible or the Constitution on the maybe two or three occasions out of a year that they believe that it helps them. You'll remember that I made a big deal out of uh, MSNBC actually reading the Bible about, a, uh, about a, I guess it would have been a year ago now, when we were all talking about the, the issues on the border. And of course, I debunked what they were saying about it. There was a wild mishandling of the scripture. But I was like, wow, MSNBC finally discovered the Bible. Good job, guys. It is a miracle. But anyway... This is just kind of run-of-the-mill for the Democrats, that they don't want to deal with the Bible. Oh, we can't use the Bible for policymaking. We can't use it to influence our decisions and our personal lives. That's something between you and God and the church, and that should be something completely separate from your political leanings and completely separate from the way that you live your personal life. That's something to keep inside the walls of the church. And by the way... You, you have to wax my, my boys down there, even if you're a woman. And if you don't, you're an evil, hateful, racist bigot. And that's what being a Christian looks like. Oh, but occasionally, when we think that the Bible kind of backs up our point, we'll trot it on out, and then the second that we're done making that point, we throw it back in the closet, because we don't want to have to deal with the rest of it. It amazes me that Democrats do this and do not even seem to detect the hypocrisy contained within that. But here's the thing. The Bible never once endorsed socialism, and it doesn't endorse any other economic sy system either. It doesn't endorse capitalism. Even though I'm a big C capitalist, I believe in the free market. I don't believe in the free market specifically because I believe in the Bible. Does it influence my worldview? Sure. Do I think that capitalism and the Bible can work together? Yeah, I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that 
you can certainly be a Christian and operate in a Christian manner in a capitalist system, but I don't think that God actually advocates for a specific economic policy or economy as a whole. I, I, I don't believe that. And that's true with that, and it's true with socialism or communism or any other economic system that you could come up with. But here's the main thing, and this is especially true of the New Testament. It's really true of the Old Testament, too, and I can make that case as well, but it's a little deeper theologically than we're going to delve into tonight. But especially in the New Testament, it's even more obvious if you're looking at the books of the New Testament. The Bible is not about governments. It's about your behavior. It's about your interactions with your fellow man and God. That's it. It's not about government. It never makes a recommendation for what government should and shouldn't do. Now, it gives some responsibilities for government. It gives some basic principles about how Christians are to react to government. But as far as giving you a point-by-point -point policy proposal, it doesn't do that. It doesn't tell you what the laws should be in your country, that sort of thing. I think that there are some biblical principles that can be applied to it, and I think that it's correct to do so. But as far as the primary message of the Bible is not, hey, here's a book that tells you how to run a perfect government. I'm sorry, it doesn't do that. It tells you how to interact with your fellow man and with God and the way that you're supposed to behave in that manner. So let's address a couple of these things that he tries to bring up. First of all, Jesus healed people for, for free and never charged a leper a copay. That is true. And again, we are focusing on individual behavior here. Because there are doctors in capitalist nations all the time that do work for free, that do not charge people. When I was going through cancer last year, my surgeon gave me surgery at cost. Didn't make any profit off of it because he knew my situation, knew I didn't have insurance, and knew that my life was going to be in danger if I didn't get the surgery pretty quickly and that I didn't have a lot of time to raise the money. And so because of that, he said, you know what, I'll do it at cost. All you have to do is cover my expenses and cover the expenses of the hospital. I won't make any money off of it. And I will be forever grateful to him for that. Uh, Dr. Buddha did a, did a great job, incredibly professional. I'd recommend him to anybody. And he's a, a upstanding guy that didn't mind helping out somebody like me that didn't have the ability to pay. But that's not the government's responsibility. He did that out of the goodness of his heart. If he were obliged to, in other words, the government told him he was not allowed to do anything other than take care of me, and that they were going to take care of it, there's no reason for me to be grateful to him. There is no charity that has taken place. Yes, Jesus did a lot of great things for a lot of sick people. We talk about that on a pretty regular basis here. But there's a difference in Jesus saying, you go out and help your brothers and sisters. You be charitable. You help out people that are in need. And saying, oh, the government should compel people to do so. That's a completely different thing. You'll notice that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, and I intend to do a Social Justice Warrior Bible episode on this before too long, uh, that Jesus didn't say, oh, well, he needs to go and, and find a, a Roman soldier and, and make the Levite and make the priest go and help that guy out. That's not what he did. The Good Samaritan took it upon himself to help his neighbor. There is no point where Jesus went out or told his disciples to go advocate for a policy that helps people in the government setting. Not one. He said, if you see a need, you take care of it, not the government, you. And that's the central theme of the Bible. And furthermore, if the Democrats want to use the Bible as our, as our law book, in other words, if a good reason for implementing a policy, if a good reason for implementing a law is, well, the Bible says that we're supposed to do X, therefore we should make it illegal to not do X or we should base all of our laws off of what the Bible says is right and wrong, well, then we're going to have to outlaw homosexuality, adultery, lying, divorce, transgenderism, greed. We're going to have to get rid of all of those things. Got to make all of those things illegal. 
Are the Democrats really willing to do that? Do they really want to go down that road? Is that the argument that they want to make? Because if we start basing our laws off of that, abortion is going to be the first thing gone. If we start basing our laws on that, then there's no reason for us to put a dime towards climate change because only God can destroy the world. If we're going to, to base all of our laws on what the Bible says to do and not do, and we're going to treat the government as though it's an individual and a person, first of all, that's a wild misapplication of the New Testament. But secondly, if that's the case, well, then an awful lot of the people that the Democrats are backing are not going to be real happy with that. Oh, and by the way, it needs to be illegal to be a Muslim because they deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. And it needs to be illegal to be a Jew because they also deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, we can't have any atheist, of course. That would be uh, incredibly inappropriate. So we got to throw all those people in jail. Do you really want the Bible to be the basis of our laws? Because I don't think the Democrats want to go down that road. And by the way, for the record, I don't either. I think that the Bible needs to influence our worldview, but I don't think it needs to be our law book. It was never written or intended to do that. Now, to his second point, does God judge nations based on their treatment of orphans and widows? Yep, absolutely. But it does so on an individual basis. You look all throughout the Old Testament. Who did the prophets say to take care of the widows and the orphans? It wasn't the government. The prophets didn't go to the king and say, Hey, king, you're the government. You're in charge of making sure that all the widows and orphans that don't have enough to eat or living in some kind of poverty or don't have a way to, make, uh, a, to, to go out and make gain for themselves, you need to go out and help them. It's not what the prophets did. They went into the streets. They went to the regular people. And they said, if you see somebody in need, you go out and you help them. It was done on an individual basis. Even when we're talking about a theocracy like Israel, established by God to be a holy nation, even when the laws of God's people actually were supposed to be for a worldly kingdom before the New Testament came and, and put all that aside, even when that was taking place, God was still primarily concerned with the relationship between individuals and between individuals and him. Even then, it fell upon, not the government, the individual people to take care of their brothers and sisters. And so, yeah, God did judge nations based on the way that they acted, based on their morality and based on the way that they treated widows and orphans. He did absolutely do that but not how the government treated widows and orphans, how they did. And that's the difference that he doesn't want to bring up. And by the way, this is something that remains true throughout the early church. Because you look through, for example, the book of James and the book of Acts, and you look through, there's passages in Colossians that allude to this as well. Who is taking care of the widows and orphans and those that are the least among us, to use the language of the scripture? Who was in charge of doing that? Not Rome, not Israel, not King Herod, not Pilate, not the governors. The church. It was their responsibility. They were the ones that were charged with making sure everybody had enough to eat. They were the ones that were selling their goods and giving the proceeds to those that had need. Show me the passage anywhere in Acts where the early church went to their Roman officials or the Jewish elders and said, hey, you guys need to be taking care of these people. You can't do it because it's not there. That was not their job. The church members took it upon themselves and saw it as their responsibility as disciples of Christ to model Christ and do good to others, not to compel other people to do so, because that's what socialism does. It holds a gun to your set head and says, oh, you will give to the poor. It's not charity. If you rob somebody and then give that money to a poor person, I mean, I guess it's better than keeping it yourself, but it's certainly not virtuous. It's not moral. And you've neither 
help, and you've done nothing to help the guy that you robbed. In fact, you've committed another wrongdoing by doing so. What's really important to understand here, because if we're comparing capitalism and socialism, again, I don't think that God or the Bible endorses capitalism, but I, don't, I certainly don't think that it does socialism either. Capitalism is not perfect. It is not God's economic system. I don't, as much as I love capitalism, I don't hold on to it with some kind of religious fervor because I don't think God honestly cares nearly as much about my economic policy as he does my soul and the way that I interact with other people on an individual basis. But I will say this. Capitalism is fragile. It can be easily corrupted. There are greedy people in the world, and they can abuse that system if they are not moral. John Adams alludes to this multiple times, I might add. And so capitalism is not a flawless system. A free market does work, and it is self-correcting, but even it cannot withstand an immoral, uncivil society. I understand that. But here's the difference in it and socialism. Capitalism can be corrupted if not managed well. Socialism starts out of the gate as evil. And as since we're talking about the Bible now, grapes don't grow from thistles. You can't have an evil root and good fruit come from that tree. You cannot have an evil bad tree and have good fruit produced from it. When it comes to socialism, the whole thing is encased in envy. That person has more than I do. That person shouldn't have that much money. We should take the money from that person. One of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not covet. You're not supposed to want your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's wife. And so, yes, capitalism is imperfect. It is not of God. And by the way, it can go wrong. But socialism starts out wrong. And so because it starts as evil, the only place that it can go is evil. Capitalism at least can be good. Socialism can never be good. And that's the difference. It is encased in sinful nature. And that's the reason, sure, the Bible doesn't necessarily say that capitalism is the way to go. It doesn't endorse it but it specifically denounces everything at the root and the core of socialism. It's rotten from the bottom up. You know, you really should like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. Oh, what's that? You want to know what's on the channel before you subscribe to it? Oh, no, 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 it's like Obamacare. So you got to subscribe to find out what's on it.